Welcome back to the Innovation Room, a podcast where we talk with leading innovation experts. Today, I have the great pleasure to chat with Sandra Fernholz on the topic of sustainable innovation. Currently, Sandra is the head of social impact and sustainability at Hype Innovation, an innovation management software company. She kicked off her career in the field from pre-sales positions, going into management, and now, well, now she's inspiring innovators all around the world to innovate sustainably. I personally like to think that our work does not define us. So just before this call, I asked Sandra to share some things what are what are important to her outside of work. And this is what she had to say. She buys fair trade clothing, has never owned a car, but is a huge fan of public transportation and biking. She shares a garden with her friends where they plant their own vegetables. And on top of all that, she still finds time to volunteer. She volunteers at Bond's World Shop to promote where, uh, fair trade products and the general concept of fair trade. So it's easy to, see, is to say that for me, Sandra, you are an inspiration. And I would love to continue talking about your gardening project, about the volunteering experience. But I promise for the sake of this podcast, I will stick to innovation and sustainable innovation. I'm so eager to learn from you, Sandra, today. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. We can talk about gardening later. <laughs> After the podcast. Okay, so I kind of gave this more broad introduction to you. So I think it would be fair to, uh, to start with more of a professional introduction. If you could tell us about your world worldview that brought you to this position and what exactly do you do in this job? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, like you said, I've been with Hype for six years at this point, but didn't start in this position where I am now. Um, but it was something that I really cared about from the beginning. I don't know, um, sustainability has just been something that has been important in my life um, and just grew over time um, more and more. Um, so it could be something like when I was managing our US team, I was on a lot of flights and um, I didn't really feel so good about that with all the CO2 emissions. So I started to drastically reduce um, my meat consumption, for example, um, which still to this day, I don't eat a lot of meat, for example. So it's just something that kind of started happening over time where I've always volunteered like my entire life. I've done something more in the social space usually. Um, and then the ecological part also kind of like grew. And yeah, at a certain point, um, this position opened up and I was really happy to take it on. And um, what that means right now is that basically it's uh, there's two parts to the job. Um, there's an internal part where I take a look at our own um, carbon emissions, our own gender equality, our own um, sustainability issues and um, ways to move forward. Um, but then I'm also a part of our consulting team. So since Hype is a company for innovation management, so we do sustainable, uh, we do software and uh, consulting for innovation management. Sustainability is kind of added onto that, and where I do regular innovation consulting work, I also consult on sustainability and innovation. So how can innovation be the vehicle to get you um, to be more sustainability? Why is sustainability important um, for innovation? So kind of like how do those two go together really well? Um, and then what can companies do to kind of like incorporate it? Um, yeah, that's that's it. <laughs> who would kind of focus on more of a positive note and also on the last chapter of your career. What would you say have been your most favorite examples uh, of maybe companies innovating in a sustainable way or adapting some new innovations that somehow like, I don't know, inspires you and maybe you would like to share that with us? Yeah, absolutely. There's lots of examples. So many of our clients are actually looking at innovating for sustainability now. It's a huge topic. Um, also, for example, at our last um, uh, big conference um, in Boulder in Colorado, um, sustainability was was one of the major aspects um, that was mentioned there. I think one of the projects that I really like um, is something that um, Sangoban do. So they produce glass um, as one of their fields and um, they initialized um, the so-called carbon fund. Um, right now it was like in their northern European region, so with around 46,000 um, people. Uh, in it in different regions and languages. And basically what they did is they have established an internal carbon price. So one um, ton of CO2 costs 50, euro, uh, 50 euros. 
And basically, whenever they reduce emissions um, anywhere outside of production, then 50 euros for each ton that has been reduced goes into the carbon fund. And the carbon fund is there to reduce their emissions within the production area, which, of course, is where they produce most emissions. So it's through innovating in other areas that money is generated to be put into the most urgent and most impactful area. And I think that is a very powerful concept. Um, so they, for example, don't work with um, with offsets or things like that, but they rather like keep it in a virtuous cycle. Do you have perhaps some smaller scale examples? Let's say if we took a company that do not manufacture anything, any physical product, but let's say consultancy agency and how could they do the sustainable innovation? Do you have examples like that? Yeah. So. Oftentimes, when we talk about ecological sustainability in services, it's not as much just because, you know, they have the luxury of not producing anything. So just by their nature, already not, you know, having a lot of waste or um, a lot of CO2 emissions or things like that. But then we can still go into other areas, right? Um, so one of the universities, for example, that we work with, one of their departments did an anti-racism campaign. So they really went out and they asked their students, their faculty, their staff, okay, how can we not just like reduce racism, but how can we be anti-racist, you know, in this specific department that we're looking at? What are the kinds of measures that we need to have? So how can we have more diversity than in there? How can we make sure that people feel good, do all these things? So when we talk about sustainability, there is ecological sustainability, but of course there's also always social um, sustainability. So when you take a look, for example, at the UN um, Sustainable Development Goals, there are 17 of them, and they go from zero hunger, no poverty, you know, they do all these things. They also go into climate change and life on, on land, life in water, you know, things like that. Um, so you always have like these different sides, and I think that every organization can contribute to some um, SDG and uh, can yeah can make it a little bit better. So I, it is kind of like this. You already covered a little bit that, but could you better explain what is sustainability in your line of work? Because it is such a big topic. And when I think about it first, like my mind goes to recycling, reusing, repairing, and stuff like that. But there's like this all innovation side, more social side, as you mentioned as well. So can you explain a bit more of that as well? Yeah, of course. So I think that. There is a great way to to kind of look at it. The um, there's this World um, Council for Sustainable Development, um, and basically they got together in 2010, and they talked about okay, what is our vision for 2050? And they said okay, we want to have nine billion people all living well in the boundaries of the one planet, and that's what sustainability is in a nutshell. So what does that mean? So basically, we have these two sides. We have the social side um, where we have the human development index in there, for example. So that takes a look at how well do people live? You know, do we have equality? Do we have poverty? Do we have education? These kinds of factors. Where are we there? And then we have the ecological side. Are we using more resources than the planet can recover, can you know, reproduce? Um, so basically what you would have then is you would have this one quadrant where people live well, you know, on the social side, but they live within the boundaries of the planet. So we want to be kind of like in the, like it's this, this graph where it's like in the lower right area there. Not a single country in the world is in that quadrant right now. But what we have to do there, and that's like why the SDGs exist, is we have to move into that area. And for some countries, it means, OK, we have to get a lot better at education. We have to get a lot better at rights for girls. We have to get a lot better you know, at all of these aspects. OK, so we need to kind of move from the left to the right. Others um, are very developed in the social sense. You know, people are in general living a good life in these countries, but we're consuming way too much water or we're emitting way too much CO2 or we're doing these things. We're not dealing well with the resources of the planet. We are exhausting the planet, basically. So then we meet, need to move, you know, from the top down. So the movement that a country needs to make is very different depending on where they are, kind of like on that scale. And the challenge that we see here is that oftentimes when the human development index goes up, so do resources. So somebody now has, you know, is living a good life. So you want to travel and you want to have a big house and you want to have a big car and, you know, these kinds of things. 
So naturally the curve is kind of like from the lower left to the upper right, but that's not where we should end up in the end. So basically we need to be at the bottom right and the movement to get there is different. And the powerful thing that organizations can do for that is that a lot of them, they're international, they are global. So they have locations in different places in the world who have different challenges. So the good thing is that then you would see with these individual locations, okay, what are your biggest challenges? Is it your community that needs more support? Is it the environment that needs more support? Is it both of them? How can we move in the right direction? So that's kind of like where corporations and, and just in general organizations can play really a big role when it comes to sustainability and sustainability is based on like these two axes or you might have heard of like ESG. So that's environmental social governance, um, whereas environment and social are kind of like next to each other and governance is something where we can make sure that things are being followed through with, right? So we create the right structures. We can we can measure things. We can make sure that we're moving in the right direction. Um, that's kind of like where that comes from. But there's so many words out there for sustainability and CSR and ESG and like all of these different things. But in general, what it means is that we need to make sure that humanity can survive, right? Because this is not about the planet survive. The planet will survive. It doesn't really care that much if we're on it or not. Yeah but we should care about that. And so that's kind of like the environmental aspect, but a lot of environmental aspects are connected to, to social aspects. And so the social perspective is an absolutely crucial one and we cannot forget about it. So we have to always combine those two because also if you take a look at kind of like the dependencies between that. So recently I read an article about that in I think it was Science or Nature, one of the big journals where they put together inequality and the environment, like what kinds of influences does that have? And so what we see a lot is that the actions of like the top, like the 1%, the richest people on the planet, yeah. you know, is the influence that they have, the impact that they have on the environment is gigantic. You know, it's way more than like millions of other people or even billions. So the more inequality we have, the more we hurt the environment usually. And so that's why reducing inequalities, making sure that people have, you know, more opportunities is such an essential factor also for the environment. What is mm -hmm. the kind of uh, point where sustainability, sustainability issues and innovation meets? Mm -hmm. So what is sustainable innovation kind of, and, and how innovation, of course, like there are these like technical solutions, like new manufacturing, maybe uh, options that will solve some issues, but outside that as well, what would you see, say is the merge of these two concepts? Yeah. So basically innovation in its essence means that we create something new, right? So it is something that is actually put into action. It's not an idea where we just talk about something, but it's something that we actually implement it. That's innovation. Innovation per se is not something good or bad. It's just something new, right? And then afterwards you see what kinds of, you know, consequences does it have, implications, et cetera. Sustainability has a specific direction usually, right? So we have an environmental or a social direction. So innovating for sustainability is often, okay, we wanna come up with something new, but we wanna make sure at the same time that it generates profit usually, which tends to be important for for-profit organizations. Um, and then, it also should, you know, not hurt the environment or be good on the social side. So that's like how you would innovate for that. Um, sustainability is playing a bigger role um, in innovation nowadays. Um, and that has to do with like multiple factors. So we have a factor that is just regulations, okay, laws, where we say, okay, this is something that you're not allowed to do. You're a big chemistry company. No, you are not allowed to dump your waste in our river, period. So maybe you need to innovate now or, you know, decades ago <laughs> in yeah. some regions, um, but that was innovation then. You, we needed to redefine the process. We needed to see, okay, if we cannot dump it in the river anymore, what else do we do with it? How do we filter things? How do we clean up things? How else do we do that, right? That's innovating for sustainability because of a law, and that's fair. Um, so that's how politics kind of like always also plays into that. Or maybe you're operating in a country now where there is a CO2 tax. So at this point, Yes, you might want to reduce your impact on the environment, but you also really want to save money, right? You don't want to have to pay a very high tax that is going up more and more over the next years. So in that case, you are changing the way 
that you're producing, for example, or maybe you are initializing some sort of uh, energy savings initiative or something like that. Like it doesn't even have to be full on innovation. It can be a continuous improvement activity where you say, okay, we want to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, for example. So these are all like different examples. And what you can do there is you can start off with sustainability. So you can kind of like ingrain it and anchor it at the beginning of the process and say, okay, this is something that we want to keep in mind, or that's specifically the purpose that we want to go for. So if you produce, I don't know, kitchen appliances, you can say, okay, right now we're innovating specifically for an energy efficient oven or an energy efficient refrigerator, right? You can do that and you can keep that in mind. Or you can take a product or service afterwards and say, hmm, oh, so it does have these consequences and now we need to fix that. So now you you do it kind of like at the end of the process, right? So that's like different ways of like how you can bring that together. So basically like uh, throughout all that you just covered, uh, I hear like these three main things. It's the social is very important, of course, the environment. And then you mentioned government governance, but then there's also like the profit because organizations are still aimed at profit. So basically that is the so-called triple bottom line, like profit planet people. And that's something that is very interesting to personally to me. And that's something we spoke a little bit before this podcast a few weeks ago. So could you kind of uh, give also like, again, a bit of a definition of what it is. And I, th I think that it would be very interesting to hear how companies can implement it, how this triple bottom line concept or the framework, it translates to business. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so let's start with the bottom line. That is something that every company knows about. The bottom line is, are you profitable or not? You know, at the end of the day, that's the very quick summary of that. Now, when we talk about the triple bottom line, we expand that concept and we add two additional pillars, like you said. So in addition to profit, which we still keep and which we don't, you know, cast away because it's still something important to have, we add people and planet. So the social and the environmental side. Now, profit is important even to nonprofit organizations. Profit is something where if you don't make any money and you go bankrupt and you have to let your employees go and you cannot you know, further do things, then you also cannot affect change anymore because you cease to exist. So profit is something, even if it's just break even, if you're just saying like, okay, we we don't have any profit like as in plus, but we we've, we've covered all of our costs. We've paid everyone. Everything is fine. Then that's still like the money that we need. That's still something that we need to operate. Now, then people and planet are added onto that. So we don't just focus solely onto profit without taking anything else into consideration. Right. OK, so we're just going to make money and we really don't care what it does to the environment. Or we really don't care what it does to our communities. No, we do care. So essentially what you start doing there is you measure other things as well. You measure your money and then you also measure the social and the environmental things. And so what you can see, like how organizations are already doing that today is through sustainability reports, right? Every large organization has the duty to do a sustainability reporting and to show what it is that they're doing um, and kind of like the goals that they've taken and where they want to go with that. And that naturally shows gaps. You know, it naturally shows, OK, we're here. We need to be here in 2030, for example. So like this is something that we're still working on. How do they work on that innovation? You know, that's how they bring that back together. So the triple bottom line is something that, yeah, is established through or is reported on through these sustainability reports um, in different ways. But it's also something that many organizations still struggle with. So profit is something that is very ingrained. And the two extra pillars, um, they try really hard um, to kind of like put them back into that. Um, but it's also difficult, you know, when you have to make decisions right now, you know, we have a crisis with the war and everything. And so what do I do when my supply chain is interrupted and I, I need new things, but maybe they don't really go with like the environmental standards that I would hope to have. Right. But it's the only option that I have right now. And I can either not produce or I can take these ones. How do you make these kinds of decisions? Right. And that's difficult. And that's basically decided on a case by case basis. And it depends very much on the manager, the person who's in charge um, and on the situation that they're in. So in your line of work, like crisis is something like I, w I still want to get back to it with the further questions, but kind of uh, going back to the examples, 
you talk with innovators every single day, oh, almost every single day in yeah. your work. So I assume that you must hear some kind of repeated worries or questions that they have. So are there some things that everyone basically shares and uh, how do you kind of try to approach those commonly shared projects or sorry, issues with the companies? Yeah. That's yeah, that's true. So specifically for sustainability is what you're Definitely, asking. Definitely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, it kind of depends. Organizations that are more mature in sustainability um, don't face some of the issues that others that are just like starting their path um, are on. So some of them that are just starting um, concerns that they have is how do I convince my management? Why is this even something um, that is important? You know, why should we even uh, look at sustainability? Now, the grand majority of organizations is past this stage, in my opinion, now. Um, so they do care about that or they say so. Many organizations right now are more or less in the stage where they say they care about sustainability and they talk a lot about it, but they don't really do a lot about it yet. Um, they want to, but it's it's difficult for them to kind of like keep going um, and reinvent themselves, you know, with sustainability because sustainability is just like everywhere, right? It covers the entire organization. So it's not just this, okay, here's like your area and this is where you stay. It's more like adding it like an, an additional layer to the entire organization. That's hard. And that's, you know, it's that's change management and that needs time and it needs people to get used to it and needs people to be convinced of it. And so depending on who your management is, that is something that is, you know, that they focus on more or less. Um, so this is this is one of the the bigger concerns. Um, but then also, you know, you have like these stages where people are worried, like we're never going to reach these goals that we've set out for ourselves. Um, we're never going to innovate fast enough. Um, so then it goes into kind of like a normal innovation pro problem, right? Because that's something that um, innovators and also innovation managers are very used to that things should change fast, but we don't have the resources or we don't have the capacity or the money or whatever it is that we're lacking at this point, like how can we do this while keeping the company afloat, right? So you have to like keep going with your normal things while you're innovating at the same time. And sometimes that's not that easy to do. So these kinds of concerns um, also uh, just kind of come up. So it has a lot to do with like personalities and like what somebody's convinced of. And if somebody, especially higher up in the hierarchy really pushes for it, but then also just like, do we have the capacity? Are we changing too fast? Are we changing too slow? You know, these kinds of aspects that we see in, in all kinds of innovation always, yeah. So are there kind of, most likely there's no kind of one size fits all solutions, but are there some kind of practical solutions that maybe someone's listening now and they realize that like, oh, this is an issue I'm facing that like, how do I approach management? How do I prove that this is valuable for people who are only focused on the one bottom line profit? Yeah. So do you have any kind of tricks up your sleeve that you could suggest to the listeners how to approach these issues? Yeah, of course. Um, so there is there's a whole variety of arguments why sustainability is something that is important for your organization. Um, depending on who you're facing, I would approach it differently. So there are people um, that are very fact-based. You know, they want to see numbers, they want to see these kinds of things. Um, so when you talk to them, um, you take a look at, okay, what do others look at, right? So for example, Let's take BlackRock, you know, the big investment company, their CEO, Larry Fink, you know, they publish a CEO, he publishes a CEO letter every year. And so this year he talked specifically about um, impact investment, you know, sustain investment into sustainability. And that's, you know, in the trillions of dollars nowadays. So that's facts, right? That's a big number. It's a lot of money. It's maybe something that you would like to participate in. So something like that. Then we can take a look at, who are your customers, you know? Um, are you B2C, are you B2B? Um, if you're B2C, oftentimes the pressure on you is growing now because like consumers want to see more sustainability and they ask a lot more questions about that. So then in that case, you might lose market share 
if you don't innovate um, in that area and if you don't become more sustainable. And so that immediately influences your bottom line, your profit. Um, so that's something that um, that can also help that. Do you have regulations that you have to adhere to? You know, are you losing money because of CO2 tax, for example? So there's a lot of hard facts that you can point out to somebody with specific numbers connected immediately to that. And then there's the more emotional argument, right? Yeah. So if you have somebody there um, who is more driven by emotions and people tend to be tr driven by both, but just in different shares, right? So if you have somebody there who's more emotionally driven or also emotionally driven, then of course you we can talk about what kind of a planet do we want to live on, right? Do you want to, like if they're rather a younger person, how do you imagine your life when you're like 50 or 60? Um, you know, or if they're a little bit older, maybe what do you want for your kids? What do you want for your grandkids? You know, things like that, which it sounds kind of, you know, oh, well, that's never going to work now, but it really does. Um, so there's a lot of, of managers that are driven by these kinds of perspectives, you know, um, where they say, okay, is this, is this the the impact that I wanted to have, you know, is this what want I want associated also with my name? So it's also a little bit of a pride thing sometimes where it's really about, okay, so what is the legacy that I want to have, you know? Um, and so basically what I usually do is this combination of facts. Okay, what is it that we see here in terms of money usually? Like what kinds of repercussions are we seeing? Also with you know, natural disasters, how much does it cost to rebuild something after a flood, a fire, you know, things like that. And if these natural phenomena go like are more and more, then it's going to cost us more and more money and prevention is easier, you know, and it costs less. So things like that. Combining facts with emotions is usually the recipe um, that I chose and tends to work. And the other factor um, that I want to mention here is time. Um, some people you talk to them once and they are willing to change everything. Most people are not that way. So then it's easier to approach them again and again. And just kind of bring it up. Don't criticize everything that they've done so far, but kind of like try to take it in steps. What are we doing right now? Like evaluate it. Okay, so this is the process how we do it now. What else could we do with that? How can we take, you know, steps? It's of course, we feel like we're driven and it's noth nothing is ever fast enough and we need to move fast. But honestly, if we completely overwhelm somebody and then they're not willing to move at all anymore, then it's not a benefit. So it's better to take smaller steps and keep going and going and going than to overwhelm someone and they just freeze up and then they don't want to do anything about it ever again. Um, so I know it feels a little bit counterproductive sometimes and we're like, oh, but we don't have any time. Um, and that's true. Um, but it's better to move forward in little steps than not at all. No. Yeah, I, I completely agree to, to from our also personal experience that uh, when you talk about innovation, everyone's kind of like so speed driven and they want like instant results, something changing now, but then sustainability is a very, yeah, sure. Like if you cut paper, that's a fast result from your office, but the long-term results, it is a very slow process. So I think these are very valuable insights that you shared. And now finally, I want to go back to that crisis topic because um, I think nowadays it's, it is very pressing to talk about these things. And a couple of weeks ago, back in September, my colleague Diana, she published an article on innovating in a face of crisis. And for those who are listening, I will be sure to add the link to this transcript so they could read the article as well. What she basically discovered in her research is that innovation and especially sustainable innovation projects are the first ones that will get dropped by companies uh, in the face of crisis uh, in these attempts to save money drastically. If this is something what will not generate profit within a few months, we are putting full stop. Is that something what you're facing now as well in your line of work? Do you see Absolutely. people do that? Yes. And would you say like that's a good kind of measurement, uh, like good way to save money or is that something too risky? Like what would you say that your opinion about this is? I mean, in that moment, it saves money, yes. Um, it's kind of like companies go into survival mode, but short term survival mode, right? So they think, OK, we're really not making the profit that we should make. So now we need to we need to take some measures and there's different measures that they have at their disposal. So 
of course you could cut projects like that. You can also let people go, which is one of the most drastic measurements that you can take. Um, but it's, yeah, that's kind of like a hard choice to make. And I don't want to just like condemn it altogether. Sometimes it does make sense to do it. And we do have to do a short-term and a long-term planning. And sometimes these projects are more of a long-term thing. What is bad is if they're never brought back. So if we go out of crisis at some point, hopefully, then things should go back to normal, right? We should bring these things up again. And what I've seen is also that just like in general, also innovation is just being put to a stop. Like people just stop innovating at that point and, or even like let their innovation managers go or dissolve entire innovation departments. We've seen all of that happening. Um, and it's, it doesn't serve the company in the long run, but sometimes we need to just, you know, do a short term break. And I can't really, of course, you should always innovate your way out of it. And of course, you should never have to go into that crisis mode. But let's face it, nobody wants to do that. You know, yeah. that is never on purpose. It's not like somebody's like, oh, well, I was bored. Let's go into crisis mode. You know, that doesn't happen. It's it's a reaction. It's a reaction to a situation that we're facing. And so in that case, we're not in a thriving mode anymore. We're just in a surviving mode. These types of projects can help turn companies around, um, but you need to have the vision and the capacity to actually go through with them at that point, right? So it is something that can really differentiate you, um, but the company needs to be in the habit of innovating. And so innovation is not something that happens like, oh, I'm sitting in my bathtub with my little ducky. I had my eureka moment, you know, sure, that happens. But honestly, most of the time we manage innovation, we build structures for that and processes and we create opportunity. We do workshops for that. You know, we actively ask people for ideas and we're actively pushing for these ideas and for them to be implemented. Right. It's not just the Eureka moment. They exist. But most of the time, that's not how it goes. Right. Most of the time we actually push for that. And when we do that then the organization is already more used to innovation. And that's also a way of how we can innovate ourselves out of the crisis mode. Now, if we're not used to that, if it's something that we just started or we've been, you know, switching it on and off or we've doing we've been doing all these things, then, of course, it doesn't just jumpstart like that, but it needs a little bit of a habit. And so in those situations, we freeze these projects because we don't know what else to do. In other situations, if we have more of the habit, we might not do that. Um, but yeah, it really depends on the company and the people. So there's no like uh, kind of what would be the advice right now for the companies uh, who are facing this kind of like measurements like, oh, we have to save money. So like what to cut off? Um, like what we're facing now in our office building is that uh, office is decide like the building decided to save energy and they cut our saunas, unfortunately, in the gyms. <laughs> But I'm happy that they're doing that instead of, I don't know, cutting some other things. But like, so is there some kind of, I don't know, healthy approach or some kind of, I don't know, steps to take to enter that, um, as you say, the crisis management mode? Yeah. So I'm a consultant, so I have to say it depends, right? It's kind yeah. of like part of my job description. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it really does depend. Um, so something like that, what you just described, I mean, to me, that sounds like... A, a healthy decision, right? It's something where you say, okay, what is more important? And it's a, it's priority. And so Asana will take up a lot of energy. And so you will cut that because it's a non-essential, right? That's how, how you would Finland. be. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree. But um, that's the thing. So like what I see happening a lot right now is because of an energy crisis, a lot of companies are actually innovating around energy savings. So Many, many of my clients right now are running these innovation campaigns where they like ask specifically, how can we save energy, right? What measures can we take? What should we change? And that's a way of how they're innovating their way out of this crisis where they're like, okay, we have to cut, you know, our energy costs most of the time, or we might just not be able to get the gas that we need, for example. And so what can we do for that? And that's actually a really healthy approach. What would be unhealthy is to stop innovating at that point and just, you know, not heat your building, for example. That would be, okay, so what do we do here? So kind of taking people with you on the journey, 
asking for their expertise and their ideas, seeing what they can do is actually really healthy. And then implementing these things as quickly as you can is a way how you can get out of a crisis. And we see that a lot with energy right now. I, like I really hope not just because of sauna, but of everything in general. I really hope that <laughs> we will see a change in the situation quite soon. Yeah. Um, what would be your favorite or ex um, advice for the companies to share, or kind of like for everyone who's listening now? Like, what would you say? Like, having everything in mind, innovation, sustainability, crisis. Kind of, what would be your lesson, or that everyone could take away from this conversation? Mm -hmm. I think both innovation and sustainability are not optional. They're absolutely mandatory to have in every organization. Without them, you will cease to exist. That's just a fact. So whether you want it or not, you have to innovate because if you don't innovate, you stagnate and you die. And without having sustainability in the mix, you just don't you don't stand a chance today anymore. It's just it's not something that is nice to have or, oh, yeah, we have a little bit of a corporate social responsibility thing. No, you need to focus on sustainability from the get go. You need to restructure the way that you do your business, and that can be your business model, it can be your products, it can be your services, whatever it is, you need to rethink the entire thing and see how it fits with sustainability and innovate for that. And the second that we stop seeing sustainability as an obstacle and as something that just costs us a lot of money, but we see it as a catalyst, as an opportunity, it is, it will be that. So that's just something like where that mindset shift needs to happen. That's the most important thing. The awareness, the way that we look at things, that needs to change. And then after that, everything is a lot easier to follow up with because we, we're, we've we taken that perspective. And so it's the perspective away from the bottom line to the triple bottom line to see, okay, how can we you know, create our business around that? And when we do that, then things happen like Patagonia, for example. When you take a look at that, I mean, let's face it, they are in the fashion industry. The fashion industry is one of, when we talk about sustainability, it's one of the most, the one, one that has the most negative impact because we can talk about workers' rights, you know, women, children working on things, you know, working conditions. So on that social side, we can talk about environmental aspects um, and that goes anything from how do you add the color to your uh, to your clothing um, what kind of an effect has the cotton on like all the the land that we grow it on these kinds of things and then also where do we make that clothing and how do we send it the whole co2 impact that it has to get here until we talk about waste when i buy a t-shirt for two euros you know and then i wear it once if even and then i just throw it out okay great now why did we have all these resources and all of that invested in that right so the fashion industry for example is one that is really tricky and it's when we talk about sustainability that's where a lot a lot of greenwashing happens and so then we have examples example companies like patagonia um that have you know were founded in the 70s and even already in the 70s decided okay we want to do things a little bit differently and so they offered to repair clothing i think four years after they started existing which is crazy when you talk about profit why would you want people to come and have their things repaired you want to sell them a new t-shirt right you want to sell them a new backpack or a new whatever you want but no they decided from the get-go to focus on that environmental side to repair things and then now also to take a look at like how are materials produced which working conditions etc so all of these things just really like grown with sustainability um and they are very profitable they make very good money they're very known as a brand and so now they have even changed you know if you want corporate apparel if you want to wear their things they don't just sell you their clothes to anyone anymore so they want to know that you as a company are worth investing into you care about sustainability right so you have to go through a process to even be able to order clothing from them as a company what kind of a decision is that it's a, it's one that differentiates you right and so now even um the founder and their like the family i mean they've chosen to not hold on to like all of that money and to just pass it on to someone because the founder was afraid that the company might not be led in a way like after he dies that he envisions and so now like all of that went into a foundation to be there for nature you know so it's a completely different approach 
And it's a company that is worldwide really known, that is very profitable, but still does all of these things on the social side, on the environmental side, supports so many um, grassroots movements in the US like for, for the environment and does all these different things. Um, and still they are profitable. So this is a really good example of how like in, a, in an industry that really struggles with sustainability, you can be different and you can still be super profitable. I like what you said. Uh, if you don't innovate, you stagnate and you die. That sounds like, you know, a new merge, um, uh, innovation metal band merge that you could, you know, come up with. That's a very, very strong and powerful statement. But um, it's a very gloomy day here in Finland, in Helsinki. It's extremely, extremely gray. And you have been a ray of sunshine to me because I love topic of sustainability. It was a great pleasure to listen to you. It was a great pleasure to have you with us. And I hope that in the future we can get back to the gardening, the volunteering, all other topics, and maybe even more innovation. Thank you for being with us. Yeah, thank you so much thank for having you, me. Thank you, Sean. <laughs>